I really like the way you phrased this question because AGI really currently feels like something that is personal to each one of us individually. And some people might think AGI has already been achieved many years ago with the release of a particular model or application, whereas some feel it's still many, many years away. Science originally was not designed to progress at the pace that it's progressing at right now. Now, a six month period is a really drastic period. So it's very easy to feel overwhelmed by what is happening. My personal philosophy is always uh, try to not be the smartest person in the room because then you're probably in the wrong room. And I feel like DeepMind gives me ample opportunities to be often the least smart person in the room. So this uh, is really a great growth opportunity. All right. So hello and welcome everyone to whoever is listening to this particular podcast. Uh, I have with me Dr. Pita Velichkovic. Pita is a staff research scientist at Google DeepMind and an affiliated lecturer at University of Cambridge. He's known for his research contributions in graph representation and learning, particularly graph neural networks and graph attention networks. Among many other things at DeepMind, he has been working on neural algorithmic reasoning, which we'll be talking more about in this podcast. Uh, Pita's research has been featured in numerous media articles and has been impactful in many ways, including Google Maps improved predictions nowadays. Um, so it's nice to have you on the sh show today, Pita. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me, Jay, and it is my pleasure as well to to be on the podcast. Hello to everyone who's listening. Yeah, too. So for for people who might not know you, you are pretty popular on Twitter, and you have been doing some fantastic work along the lines of graph representation learning. But can you tell more about uh, taking a step back? What was your entry point in AI? Like, how did you before joining uh, Google DeepMind and before even pursuing your PhD? How did you get to know about AI, and what interested you most about it? Right. Yeah, I guess it's a good a place to start as any. I have uh, gone into uh, machine learning through the path of theoretical computer science. So my initial interests uh, for my you know, post-secondary education have been centered on classical algorithms, data structures, uh, theory of programming languages, and these kinds of things. So I've basically come in through a very theoretical computer science lens. And uh, what allowed me, the conduit that allowed me to make the jump towards uh, something that's a bit more machine learning oriented was uh, bioinformatics. So I ended up deciding to do a bioinformatics uh, project for my final year undergrad dissertation at Cambridge. And um, uh, I did this because uh, I knew from previous experiences that bioinformatics is full of classical algorithms. And this was still the thing that interested me the most at the time. And uh, shortly after starting my work uh, on this project with my advisor, Pietro Leo, he basically recommended to me that uh, actually most of the people in bioinformatics nowadays uh, at least include some elements of machine learning in their work and that I should really learn machine learning to kind of try to stay ahead of the curve. And uh, this was actually what initially uh, prompted me to, uh, to make the jump to machine learning. I ended up learning it for the purpose of this project. I really liked it, proceeded to do a, a PhD in this topic as well. So that's really, that's really how I got started in the area. Interesting, interesting. And and one of your uh, earlier works, I think, um, like, correct me if I'm wrong, that would be along the lines when you were doing your PhD, which became very impactful, this graph attention networks. So I want to learn, like, how did that project came along? Like, what was the initial problem that you were working on during your uh, thesis or in your PhD? And how did that work came along along the lines of uh, ideation? Sure. Yeah, so uh, because I sort of, uh, as I just explained in my previous answer, I did not really have a huge grounding in artificial intelligence uh, before starting my PhD. I had to kind of <clears throat> learn things as I went along. And uh, as a result uh, of the, as a consequence of basically the way in which I learned, which was usually through, you know, publicly available online courses like Coursera and Udacity and so on, I tended to latch onto topics and directions that were most covered by those tutorials. So, you know, at the time, this was the year of 2016, the most popular examples revolved around building image classifiers for cats and dogs. So I ended up working quite a bit in computer vision, although I was still quite fascinated by algorithmic structures. So a lot of my research, even within computer vision at the time, was heavily inspired by trying to hunt for hidden patterns and structure and data. Um, 
And what caused me to pivot to the graph direction was actually when I did my first uh, Mila internship uh, in Montreal within uh, Joshua Bengio's team. And uh, basically at the time, this was, uh, you know, the summer of 2017, super exciting time to be doing deep learning research. The transformer preprint had just come out on the archive and I was working in the lab that was responsible for one of the earliest forms of content-based attention. So like already then people could tell that these ideas were, were going to be pretty big. Another area that was gaining quite a bit of popularity was graph representation learning at the time. So people were starting to realize not all data is images or text, but there's lots of room for interesting, abstract, irregularly structured data points as well and exploiting them. So basically uh, these two directions came into contact together during my Mila internship. And we were interested in applying graph machine learning techniques to analyze certain brain data sets. And uh, it just happened that uh, the current state of the art methods at the time were not uh, theoretically capable enough for handling the specifics of the brain graphs that we were dealing with. And uh, we had to find a way to generalize them and make them more powerful. And you know, inspired by the successes of content-based attention and the transformer preprint, we were basically uh, like the inspiration was there to use concepts from content-based attention to improve the performance of graph machine learning methods. And that is how what became Graph Attention Networks was first conceived. Interesting. And I was just going through some of your talks uh, that you have given along the lines of graph attention networks. And in one of the talks, you did mention that um, in order to reach or at least achieve or realize AGI graph representation learning is one of the roadblocks. Like, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Like, why do you like, first of all, like maybe if you can try to explain what in like technical sense, what AGI could be like, I know it's a very, a very open-ended definition, like in term, in what do you understand by AGI and why do you think graph representation learning has a major role to play? All right. That's a very good question. So first of all, what does AGI mean for me personally? I think I really like the way you phrase this question because AGI really currently feels like something that is personal to each one of us individually. And some people might think AGI has already been achieved many years ago with the release of a particular model or application, whereas some feel it's still many, many years away. So it's like, it's really hard to see where we globally fall on the spectrum. I personally think it hasn't been achieved yet because I struggle to see any proper internalization of uh, the concepts of computation inside these models. And I feel like they're really good at what they do, but what they do is not strictly speaking, say a reasoning procedure or something like that. So the way I perceive AGI, it will be some kind of a system or a collection of systems really that are capable uh, taken together to execute uh, a wide variety of tasks at the level of a properly intelligent system that is able to, you know, internalize concepts and maybe even recompose them and form new pieces of knowledge on the way. And if you are following, you know, the way in which I'm setting up the structure of what I'm expecting the AGI to look like, I'm telling you about various concepts, how they relate to other concepts, creating new pieces of knowledge and connecting it to what you already have. I'm basically describing yeah. a graph, aren't I? So this is the yeah. reason, like, Fundamentally, a graph data structure can be, uh, you know, is arguably central to the very process of cognition. No matter how you choose to structure it, it is all about experiences and how you relate them to past experiences and what's the salient knowledge inside those experiences. So, like, graphs are really front, uh, left, right, and center uh, in all of these discussions. And as a result, we better have a good model to do graph representation learning if we're hoping to build something that is generally intelligent rather than just specializedly built for a particular application. I see. So like the underlying hypothesis for you is like in general, the knowledge structure of how human cognition replicates is much more replicated in the graph representation format rather than other kind of unstructured data that we have, like let's say language or vision, like the way how we are approaching it in end-to-end -end deep learning, one modality model could be, could be, limited in, in, in terms of the use cases. Yeah. I mean, graphs just happen to be a very nice abstraction for pretty much anything discrete.
I see. I see. And 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 we you you talked about like how the field of uh, transform was was coming along when you try to develop the graph attention networks, and uh, graph attention networks like in its name itself uses attention mechanisms a lot. So can you tell a list, tell us a little bit? Are there any distinctions between the attention mechanisms that we have in transformers versus how we have it in graph attention networks? If at all there are any distinctions, and how do how 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 is the idea of attention being interpreted nowadays varies uh, varies differently for different architectures and different applications? That's a good question. I would say that uh, in the context of graph attention networks, we are really trying to be agnostic to the specific choice of the attention mechanism. In fact. If you read the way it is presented inside the paper, we really have an abstract mechanism that looks at features of two neighbors and decides the attention coefficient. You can decide to slot in dot product attention there if you want, and then you will effectively get a masked transformer. You can decide to slot uh, you know, deep attention like was done in the work of Bakhtanao and others, and this will give you deep attention, which is arguably more potent than uh, dot product attention. What we actually ended up implementing for that paper, which might be another way to praise your question, uh, was uh, the kind of attention that worked really well for the graph machine learning benchmarks that we had available at the time. And uh, as you might expect, uh, the field was just starting to gain traction. So there wasn't really a lot of data available to us to like, uh, you know, meaningfully uh, package uh, these things up in a way that won't overfit very drastically. So we really had to go for the simplest model possible. We ended up going for what's called linear attention, where the attention mechanism is just one linear layer applied to the concatenation of the two nodes. And as a result of doing this, there were some theoretical properties that made this uh, slightly easier to scale than other types of attention. But then also it, there were certain problems that it fundamentally was not able to fit. Now, this was a totally fine thing to do for the data sets that we did because really it was that or overfit. There wasn't really any middle ground at the time. But it did also basically prompt people to some years later reassess this base decision that we made back then and say, yeah, in the light of the new data sets that came around, we should be doing deeper forms of attention. And in fact, uh, one quite influential paper that came out to this regard relatively recently was the so-called GAT v2 paper, which took the concept of graph attention networks and then applied deep attention to them, showing theoretically why deep attention is a good idea in terms of being able to fit various kinds of functions better. So. Yeah, I would say uh, we are quite agnostic about it. You can make it a transformer. We had to make it even weaker than a transformer because the constraints at the time forced us into doing that. But uh, you know, in recent times, people have made these GAT v2 models and so on, which basically uh, go as deep as you possibly can and have like a universal universal approximation property in there. I see. And is it like, if, if, if I can extend this question into different modalities, if you see the common trend that we have, the idea of attention mechanism pretty much making the models or architectures more efficient when it comes to language or sequential predictions or when it, uh, graph representation learning, even in reinforcement learning. Uh, but one one field, like I think computer vision, that has been least, uh, I would say, benefited from the attention mechanism, or yet we have like not devised any good architectures that can leverage uh, attention mechanism in it to improve uh, models that are standard convolution-based uh, neural networks. Is it fair enough to say that attention could be also useful for vision-based uh, architectures? I'm not sure if you have the expertise or uh, any opinions on this. I don't have expertise, but I do have opinions, which uh, yeah. is a great place to be, right? Um, anyway, so I would say that, uh, so maybe to make this question a little bit more tractable, because generally speaking, any layer can work anywhere if you try hard enough, right? So maybe yeah. it's a bit topological. The one thing that might be interesting for us to ponder is how would attention stack up against, say, an image convolution, which has traditionally been you know, the, the, main, the main kind of player in this space. This is a topic I ponder quite a bit because uh, uh, it arises naturally as a point of discussion in our geometric deep learning blueprint, which is uh, uh, this proto book that I co-published with uh, Jean Bruna, Michael Bronstein, and uh, Taku Cohen. Hopefully soon the full book will come out as well. Um, where, you know, we have a very clear mathematical argument for why convolutions are the only possible linear translation equivariant layer 
and therefore, in some sense, the only legitimate layer for image processing, as long as you assume translation symmetry. So now suddenly somebody comes in with this uh, vision transformer and makes the claim that uh, actually you don't need the convolution to perform really well. The transformer is going to do some of this already for you. And arguably, because it doesn't have this rigidity of the convolution, it might discover things that a convolution might not discover so easily. So, for yeah. example, relationships between things on opposite sides of the figure or something like that, because convolutions are inherently local. So what's my take on this? I think that having a more relaxed model can always lead to you being able to fit different kinds of functions better. So in theory, making the model less constrained means that you are going to, uh, in theory, be able to achieve better performance. And we can all agree on the fact that transformers are less constrained than convolutional networks. You can always imagine a convolutional layer as a special case of an attention layer where you're only allowed to attend over immediate neighboring pixels and things like that. Um, however, uh, that being said, a lot of the things that make vision transformers perform really well in these particular tasks are uh, basically uh, some tricks and modifications to the architecture that are not particularly tied to the transformer as it is. So there's the idea of, say, breaking down the image into many patches and treating them as yeah. tokens. There is the idea of using specific activation functions that are more advanced than rail use and things like that. But none of these ideas are not deployable in a ComNet as well. So you could feasibly yeah. try ComNet with all of these ideas. And some people actually went ahead and did this. Uh, it was a very famous paper, uh, a ComNet for the 2020s, which basically takes all of that yeah. great stuff that bits were able to find and uh, tries it with a ComNet. And surprise, it works actually quite well. And the ComNets are competitive with the best transformers. So what's the takeaway lesson here? I think one of the things that uh, also implicitly drives the way machine learning research develops nowadays is the value of funding and the value of hype. So if there is a term that's attracting considerable attention, like transformers right now, you might be incentivized to publish more research on the topic of transformers because saying you're working with transformers might make you look more attractive to possible you know, students to work with or funding agencies to get funding for or something like this, right? So yeah. basically, um, the idea is that uh, uh, this then inspires a great, a great collection of groups to participate on this large-scale worldwide hyperparameter tuning operation that tunes vision transformers to perform the best they possibly can, while yeah. not necessarily paying a lot of attention to trying those same tricks on ComNets. So I think there's a bit of a factor there. I don't fundamentally think that uh, at least on the current benchmarks we have, like ComNets are not within reach of uh, transformers. I think that uh, I think you can get them to perform equally or potentially even better. Um, but the lay of the land is that you can take a less constrained model and of course achieve same or possibly even better results depending on the specifics of the function that you need to map. I hope this I hope this makes it reasonably clear. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's an open-ended research, so definitely I wasn't expecting a very uh, correct answer. And just to add to that, I think I recently read a very uh, highly cited work from uh, John Hopkins University by Professor mm -hmm. Yuli, and uh, in one of in, in those in that particular paper, they do a very head-to-head -head comparison between these two architectures, and not just architectures, even the training procedures, right? Like they use the training procedures, how we use schedulers and other learning rate decays and all those kind of stuff. Uh, in transformers and they also use it for convolutions and they see that in some cases it helps so it could be like just a way that maybe transformers don't really directly help in the field of vision but just the way how we train our transformer architecture might we can leverage that using convolution architectures but to, to be honest i think the conclusion from that paper was that vision transformers in some ways did outperform but again the the the, incre the increment in performance was very marginal so it's very hard to argue that if vision transformers are going to replace or is it going to cause like a 
paradigm shift in vision so but yeah it's it's an it's an it's, it's a fun field to be in and i agree i think um wherever the hype goes and especially it's very hard to train vision transformers in my personal experience like i have been lucky to have like 800 gpus but before that it's it's very hard to even load the transformer model with just one batch size especially if you're working like big imaging data sets so it becomes a game of different kind of competitions rather than just fundamental knowledge so yeah mm -hmm. And, and and two things I think from that particular qu question that I'll, I'll maybe revisit in different questions is one of the things that you said, like in theory, it is expected that if you have less constrained model, it will perform better. And I think I'll, I'll plug in that questions once we start talking about neural algorithm reasoning, because it's a fun thing that you do, do mention that. But before I go into that, and for the benefit of listeners, can you... Can you tell us a little bit about the blueprint that you have for the framework neuroalgorithmic reasoning? Like I was going through it and I think the brief idea is that you take the best of both worlds, classical algorithms and end-to-end -end deep learning arch architectures. So what were the pros and cons that you weigh and what, what is the problem that you are trying to address using neuroalgorithmic reasoning? Sure. So, well... Uh, it sounds like potentially a little bit of a vague scope, but uh, in the first instance, what we are really interested in is capturing computations with neural networks. So actually making networks empowered to execute computation. And here by computation, we often, we want to make it very concrete what we mean by that. So we mean classical algorithms. So classical algorithms are very nice objects to work with because they are very well defined they allow you to look at how they process data on arbitrary scales they are you know well established skills that pretty much every software engineer has to learn and internalize uh, to in order to support them in their career so and, and you know they generally prop you up for uh, for good general purpose uh, problem solving right so uh, in the context of uh, neural algorithmic reasoning, we are interested in how do we empower neural networks to behave a little bit more like algorithms. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, the kinds of problems we want to solve with this are, well, let me put it this way. A lot of the times when our current best systems tend to underperform is uh, around the circumstances and situations where um, basically... Uh, you are required to robustly reason about some kind of state over a very long trajectory uh, of like step-by-step -step reasoning, or you are required to, uh, you know, be robust in the face of slightly different inputs of different sizes or to recognize when a particular input is out of reach for your computations, right? Neural networks are currently not really trained to behave well in these kinds of regimes. And uh, there's a lot more focus in, I will give you a training set and let's assume that this training set is pretty representative of everything you're ever going to see. And you know, in this regime, we know how to do quite well. I would argue the recent successes of large language models are a pretty good, uh, pretty, pretty good spotlight to this fact. Now, um, so now we have to ask ourselves what comes next? Like what if we want to build a system that's able not just to perform really well on similar inputs as the ones you give it at training time, but also if you're asked to solve the same problem over more objects than you've ever seen at training time. And this will naturally come about if you want to do machine learning in scientific applications, because some, somehow science by definition involves investigating scenarios you haven't yet seen. And, uh, you know, models might try to do some very interesting uh, uh, combination of techniques and guesswork and maybe some retrieval to try to uh, break down answers to some of these questions using the knowledge they already have. And sometimes they can be quite successful. Like I'm sure we can scientifically find a lot of low hanging fruits with the current methods. But that being said, if we truly want a system that is capable of thinking more steps ahead and actually adapting itself to the new situation, you need, at least as a fundamental backbone, to be able to robustly execute what the neural network is doing computation-wise, both uh, in distribution of the training data and out of distribution of the training data. And that's something, by the way, that algorithms do naturally. Like by design, an algorithm will behave exactly the same on an input of size 5 and an input of size 5,000. It's not going to be affected by this. Whereas neural networks tend to get really affected by the size of the input that you give them compared to what they've seen. So 
yeah, if I have to maybe make a very generic claim on what we would like to deploy these techniques on, it is something that will help us build true AI scientists, but not only AI scientists, but also AI tutors, for example. Because if you're going to be tutored by someone, they better really understand and internalize the concept that they're trying to explain to you. And yeah. I would argue that current state-of-the-art systems are not really internalizing the concepts that they are trying to teach you about. They might be really useful. And if you know how to use them well, you can go a really long way. But I would not be comfortable if I was starting out my computer science career right now without any previous background knowledge. I would be uncomfortable asking a system like this to tutor me on computer science topics because I've seen the ways in which they confidently fail. And this is a problem, yeah. right? Like, I'm fine with a system that fails if it's able to tell me that it's about to fail or to anticipate that this is beyond its reach. But saying that something is very, like sounding like something is very confidently true when it actually isn't is a sign for me that it hasn't really internalized the computation underpinning this problem. So I hope this kind of gives you a rough high level idea. I see. Um, like, so is it like one of the questions that comes to my mind when, when I hear about this framework is one of the benefits we have from end-to-end -end deep learning uh, frameworks is like novel discovery, right? Like there is a chance that we might discover something new that the model sees in terms of patterns or any kind of uh, decision-making uh, pivot points, uh, which is typically attributed to deep learning that we were able to find patterns within the within the decision making process that that was just previously not comprehended by humans or not understandable would you say that we would be stuck or i i don't, I don't know if what's the right word but we would be limited to any kind of suboptimal solutions when we use neural algorithmic reasoning frameworks because we have certain things embedded in the framework um, that is that is based on human knowledge hmm. so okay that's a very valid question and I fully agree that like in its most basic formulation, neural algorithmic reasoning is going to latch you onto the biases of the kinds of computation we currently have. But uh, I feel like this is a necessary first step to be even able to properly evaluate how a system generalizes. Like to be able to evaluate how does something perform out of distribution, you need to be able to generate inputs out of distribution. And for most real world problems, uh, gathering data might be really expensive, out of distribution might be hard to quantify, and all of those things. Like this, this just makes it really tricky for that research to progress in a grounded way. And you know, you might be solving some of your evaluation benchmarks much better, but who's to say that that benefit is not coming from something which isn't, uh, you know, being able to reason out of distribution. So algorithms just, you know, provide a very nice, clean, formal environment for studying these effects and these effects only rather than you know being potentially uh, subjected to a multitude of effects where it's really hard to tell which one is uh, which one is dominating where right so i fully agree that like if you just naively apply capturing computation to the existing body of human knowledge and algorithms you are not going to achieve the maximum potential of methods like this but uh, once a model understands how to robustly execute something that it has internalized, be it an existing algorithm or a different one, who's to say that then we cannot use these systems to potentially build better algorithms that then we can use to enrich our data set and kind of have a self-improving process. In fact, when you think about some of our state-of-the-art uh, algorithms for really hard problems like MP-complete problems, often the best uh, heuristics we have for those algorithms are carefully crafted combinations of these standard algorithms we already have access to, right? So for example, one of the very famous approximation algorithms for tr uh, the traveling salesperson problem or TSP is to very carefully combine walking in a tree with computing a spanning tree and then, you know, figuring out interesting ways to close cycles. So really a combination yeah. of classical well-known algorithmic procedures, so. I see. So would you say that there would be like a fair balance for people to understand where exactly to use this particular framework? Like, would you have any limitations of the of the chart that you would like to say that, okay, in certain cases, it would be debatable that neural algorithmic medicine might not give you the best solution. Uh, like, how, how does someone decide if this framework is useful for my problem set? Hmm. I mean, it's, uh, it's actually a very interesting point. So it's a framework that actually hopes to build very generic outputs, which could be mm -hmm. useful to everyone. 
Uh, but yeah, in the context of a single project, would it be useful to someone right now? I would say it would depend on how much generalization is required and of what kind. So if you need to uh, think about how will your system behave under very different circumstances than the ones you have in your training data, or you're just simply unable to collect training data for all the possible situations you might be able to deal with, or you have some priors that like, if you were able to extract from your data exactly the right variables, it reduces to a simple call of an algorithm or something like this, then those situations can be ones where neural algorithmic reasoning can be quite helpful for you, right? Um, yeah. As for what might be out of reach of algorithmic reasoning, it's really hard to tell at this time. We're still kind of working out the theory of how far the rabbit hole goes. I would like to think that ideas from algorithmic reasoning and algorithmic alignment can be applicable in a lot of problems, uh, spanning science as well as other forms of applied work. But uh, yeah, it's really hard to tell at this point. I would say there's a pretty strong alignment with anything involving classical algorithms and computations and anything involving physics and simulations. So these kinds of areas tend to be quite strongly suited to algorithmic alignment ideas. Yeah. And also, can you elaborate more on, I think uh, you have mentioned that this particular work or this framework has been used in Google Maps to improve the prediction by a certain amount of uh, accuracy. So like, can you explain for people who might not know is like, uh, let's say if someone just comes up and says like, why just I don't use any classical algorithms, let's say Dijkstra's algorithm to find the shortest path for point A to point B. What is the argument that uh, any kind of deep deep learning architecture brings in over here? So can you paint the picture like what what would be a use case for something like Google Maps, which, which has which receives like millions of queries a day? What would be a scenario if people use classical algorithms and what is the role of any neural networks in this particular scenario? That's a great question. To apply the extras algorithm, you need a static graph with a single scalar on every single edge. So let's let me now unpack for you how this basically never holds in real world road networks. First, the graph is not static at all, right? So <clears throat> traffic very dynamically moves over time. New actors come into play all the time. You can have, you know, road accidents and things like that that very quickly make a particular portion of road inaccessible. So like there's lots of things that can happen, sometimes unpredictably so, some things are more predictable than others, that will immediately affect uh, what, the, what the state of the graph even is, right? So that's the first place where applying pure Dijkstra might be really hard to do. And secondly, even if you were able to, you know, somehow create one canonical graph that will represent your situation at any particular time of day, with all the... Uh, uh, attributes present. How do you decide these scalars? So what is it actually that we're optimizing? Dijkstra's algorithm, as we know from computer science, is an algorithm for finding shortest paths in a network. But does an optimal path in a road network always mean shortest? And also shortest in what? Is it shortest in length? Is it shortest in the speed uh, that it will take you to get there given the current road conditions? Is it shortest in the speed it will take you to get there given potential future conditions that you do not have access to right now? Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of these things are potentially quite, uh, quite interesting to ponder, right? And uh, even more so, you might want to, you know, as someone who is thinking about 21st century issues, climate change and so on, like uh, how do you, uh, like would an optimal path be maybe one that uses the least amount of gas? Would it sometimes be okay to ask someone to go to a place of interest on a bicycle if it's within reach rather than uh, using their cars, right? So there's yeah. lots of different possible meanings for what best means and what shortest means that like this is not something and, and, the, and the very nature of what's optimal for some might be very context dependent. And all of these are situations where, you know, classical algorithms were not designed to deal with this. They were designed to deal with an abstract situation that was perfectly completely specified, right? I've just yeah. described to you several scenarios where that's just not the case. So if you wanted any more reasons, uh, if you wanted any reasons for why deep learning is a good tool for routing uh, uh, problems inside real world road networks, you know, look no further than some of these arguments. 
Yeah. And I think one of the benefits that you mentioned about uh, algorithmic reasoning is also the idea of interpretability, right? Like any kind of predictions make it more interpretable uh, using this framework. So can you paint a uh, use case, like how exactly this could be useful for, let's say, Google Maps? Like what exactly is being quantified when we say it has improved the interpretability of any predictions? Um, I mean, the so the aspect of interpretability, we haven't... We haven't explored it as much as I would want us to explore it. So this is still very much a work in progress, but we do have one uh, AAAI paper from a few years back that uh, looked at concept-based explanations of algorithmic reasoners. So the good thing about these kinds of systems is uh, internally, they might be doing things that are not that easy to inspect. But <clears throat> if you have an algorithmic decoder that's handy from say pre-training on a particular algorithmic trajectory, you can query it. And that, uh, that uh, decoder can then tell you what is the model internally thinking about, like what is the pathfinding problem it's trying to solve internally when you're giving it a particular potentially raw input. So these kinds of, like the fact that there is a grounding between the embeddings of the system and a downstream algorithmic problem means that you might be able to map the real world instances you're solving with uh, a particular abstractified uh, structure over which that solving is taking place. So in that sense, you might be able to do interpretability. And in our AAAI paper, we were actually even able to extract full first order logic formulae out of models that were trained in an algorithmic reasoning manner to, among other things, verify that these models are indeed implementing a correct rule. Now, of course, these methods are very early stage and it's gonna take a long time before I can confidently call them explainable techniques, but in the very least, we can see some avenues for uh, improving explainability because you have grounding in a process that we actually can interpret. And maybe like a silly question that I wanted to ask is like most of the interpretability research claims that there is a trade-off, right? Like performance versus uh, interpretability uh, trade-off. Like if you if you have if you use a model that is interpretable, it will have lower performance than a non-interpretable model. I'm I'm curious. Like, did you find any kind of such trade-offs in neural algorithmic re reasoning framework also, or is it like clearly that these frameworks most of these times outperform uh, standard end-to-end -end deep learning models? Uh, so algorithmically aligned models, uh, if designed properly, we have theory that basically says they are going to be better at out of distribution generalization on these kinds of problems. I need to stress though, like I really mean just out of distribution. So in distribution, yeah. like inside the domain that you prepared training data for, very often, a lot of the models we play with, you cannot distinguish them at all. So a transformer will perform well, a basic GNN will perform well, an algorithmically aligned graph neural network will also perform well. You cannot tell them apart. Sometimes maybe even the transformer will perform the best. However, then you try to crank up the, uh, the knob and give it inputs that are much bigger than the inputs it has seen at training time. And there you start to see dramatic falls. So some of the methods that were 100% in distribution might end up performing at only about 20 or 30% on a two times bigger data set. And you know, it's really the question of how much of this performance is retained when I take you out of what you are expecting that measures the progress. And I think there's a really nice spectrum that algorithmic alignment offers you there, which is you have the algorithm itself, which trivially aligns to itself and will have 100% accuracy on itself, no matter what size of input you prepare. You have something like a multi-layer perceptron, which is maximally flexible, so has no structure whatsoever. So it can fit basically anything you want, but you might need a lot of data to get there. So naturally, these models might work well in distribution, but like really collapse out of distribution. Then you have things like transformers, which people might not realize this because transformers are remarkably, they're advertised as remarkably general, but they're already heavily computer science inspired. Like you already have separation of data into separate token uh, information. Right. You have the old pairs interactions of self-attention, which gives you a relational prior. It, and you know, the self-attention equation initially was inspired by, you know, the neural Turing machine paper, which motivated it directly in trying to model content-based random access memory in uh, computers. So yeah. some of the original formulations of what became uh, transformer self-attention were really trying to model operations of a computer. So in many ways, transformers themselves are also playing the algorithmic alignment game. 
and they've hit the nice sweet spot of what is scalable on the current hardware and having just the right level of priors to be generally applicable without like over applying themselves to any particular problem. And this like puts them in this really sweet spot for doing a great job in distribution. And then of course, when you train on the entire internet, the in distribution becomes really, really large and really, really, <laughs> right? So these algorithmically aligned models are now somewhere in between the algorithms and the transformers. They are giving you a little bit less flexibility, but if you play your cards right, they can continue to be very flexible while constraining computation just in the right place so that you know what to do better when you have specific robust traces of computation that need to happen out of distribution. So yeah, at least if we look at out of distribution generalization, which I told you at the beginning is the key part of what we're looking at, these algorithmic aligned models tend to drop a lot less than non-aligned ones. And there's usually a quite predictable way to anticipate how much will different models drop off. Yeah. And and to be fair enough, yeah, I think um, for someone like me who has been working on applied research a lot, I think this framework is really useful because many times I collaborate with medical professionals and they are not most of the times really concerned about getting the accuracies very high, but they are more interested in using AI to discover something new that they haven't been able to uh, using medical knowledge or existing knowledge on observational science. So it's it's very useful in these, these kind of frameworks. And in fact, I think uh, when, when I recently started working with genomics data sets, it's like a very very high dimensional data sets, it's very hard to interpret and really understand anything that's going on and any kind of model that maybe performs like using MLP, it, it works great when we report results in any kind of manuscript that yeah, yeah I'm getting more than 90% accuracy, but what does it mean when it comes to um, actual knowledge? If I want to get any clinical regulations from the FDA, what do I really talk about? So I think these kind of frameworks would be very useful to even uh, push the sciences of interdisciplinary uh, fields forward. So yeah, it, it has great potential. And like you said, like using it in the right way would be something that maybe you should would be the focus uh, moving forward in the community. Yeah. And I want to switch case and maybe zoom out from your uh, specific research works to more along the lines of your personal research career. And I want to learn, like, I think you have been working in DeepMind for like more than three or four years. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting the timeline. Almost but five. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Almost five. Um, and it, it's one of those labs that I think most of the AI researchers dream of working in because it, they have been working at really fundamental problems that matters to a lot of people. So I want to learn what excites you personally working the most at DeepMind? Like what part of DeepMind that you enjoy the most coming from academia? So I guess it's a very good question. I think for me personally, I really appreciate, uh, first of all, the community here. So like I tend to get inspired when I'm surrounded by inspiring people. <clears throat> I have this, you know, my personal philosophy is always... Uh, try to not be the smartest person in the room because then you're probably in the wrong room. And I feel like DeepMind gives me ample opportunities to be often the least smart person in the room. So this uh, is really a great growth opportunity that uh, I have, I hope, taken with both hands over the past four year period. Um, so yeah, just generally being surrounded by really inspiring people, but they are not just inspiring, they're also super reachable and, you know, accessible and being able to just casually schedule a meeting with someone whose work I really admired over the years is something that uh, does not come easily in the world of research. And uh, it's something I really appreciate. I also really appreciate the overall uh, atmosphere, collaborations, and generally the level of opportunities and the diversity of opportunities that we get. So, and here I'm not talking just about uh, the amount of scalability we're able to do to our architectures, which is maybe the more common resource people think about. I think it's also the connections and the kinds of projects and partnerships we engage with. I think Google DeepMind is quite unique in some aspects on the kinds of uh, projects we embark ourselves on. So some of the things that I've had a chance to work on, we've already touched upon the deployment of uh, our models inside Google Maps, which was obviously a pretty big milestone for me. And arguably it is something that I've helped build that uh, directly influences a lot more people than anything else I have ever built. So it's uh, that's been obviously a pretty groundbreaking moment. And working in a company like this was basically the only thing that exposed me to something that affects this many users at once, right? 
Then there is the second project I worked on, uh, which received quite a lot of attention, which is our uh, paper from the Nature Covers, which uh, used uh, AI to detect hidden structure inside mathematical objects. And then yeah. working together with mathematicians who analyze these structures, they were then able to go away and uh, write conjectures and proofs that settled some long-standing problems in geometry and topology and uh, representation theory. And this was pretty exciting for me, not just because I got to publish a paper that was on the cover of Nature, but perhaps even more so that I was able to meaningfully contribute to a work of a top-tier mathematician to the point where we published a paper in a top-tier mathematics journal. Which is one of the which was one of the two contributions packaged inside our nature paper, and uh, I must stress on you this was a you know long standing personal dream of mine because I came into uh, computer science after studying at a mathematical oriented high school and I used to be always I'm to this day I'm still fascinated by the rigor and purity of mathematics and. Uh, I very quickly realized after starting my high school that I'm probably not going to become a mathematician because I just don't have that particular predisposition towards doing mathematics research and just uh, that kind of work. I'm not that good at it. But I always dreamed to be able to somehow influence the field of mathematics in a different way with something that I am actually good at. And yeah, this paper basically allowed me to put my name on a pure mathematics paper without really knowing pure mathematics. And uh, once again, this type of opportunity doesn't easily come by in most even machine learning companies. So Google DeepMind is quite unique in how they approach science, I would say. And most recently, which is I think also a really fun uh, mention, we put this work on the archive uh, a, few, a few weeks ago. We worked together with uh, Liverpool, the football club, to build mm -hmm. uh, AI systems to uh, uh, help uh, uh, recommend and uh, deploy tactical suggestions for corner kicks in the game of association football. And uh, <clears throat> once again, this is an engagement that's quite interesting for me personally. I spent uh, a, a sizable amount of time during my uh, develop development years uh, looking at uh, the game of football, either in person or on the TV. And, uh, you know, being able to actually do something that might be impactfully used by coaches of a top tier club is something that, you know, when even when joining DeepMind, I could never have dreamed that an opportunity like this would show itself, but it actually has. And it was like, I saw it, I wanted to work on it, and it was very easy for me to jump on board and work on it. So yeah, I really appreciate the flexibility, the collaborations and the opportunities. They're all like really fantastic part of what makes DeepMind work for me. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I was reading the Tech Tech AI paper just yesterday. I mean, not the biggest Liverpool fan, I, Liverpool uh, Liverpool fan, I would say definitely. But yeah, it's a it's a fun paper. I think I uh, I was gonna actually ask you that question, but we were just running out of time. But I think it's a fun paper. I think in terms of getting insights that we were talking about, like using this particular framework to learn something new or uncover some patterns that were uh, unknown before, is something um, that can be useful. So I mean, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be linking that particular paper in the show notes so like people can check out. And it's a, it's a fun paper. I I would say it's a fun paper rather than just uh, getting some new insights. So it's a fun paper in terms of results. Um, but let, let, yeah, for a follow up on that question is let me ask you, I think in, in AI research, we have seen that there are two particular fields that are emerging a lot. The one that works on the theoretical or fundamental side of progressing the AI knowledge. And the other one is like you, you coming up with creative ideas in terms of applied AI, right? So like we have seen lots and lots of applications being uh, pushing. So what, what, interests you most about like uh, any kind of project that you are you're coming up with or you are being presented with like is it the fundamental side or the applied side that you enjoy the most about that particular project it's a good question um and uh i would say that personally i appreciate the fundamental side a little bit more, but that's just, I think that might also be a consequence of the way that I was uh, brought up in terms of my, uh, you know, uh, STEM education prior to university and my university education. I have been to some extent trained to value rigor above all else. So the fundamental aspect of it is certainly really important to me. And uh, no matter what is the downstream project I'm working on, I will always try to make it as generally applicable as possible and hopefully, you know, be able to show some nice properties of the approach and things like that, which all falls under the umbrella of fundamental research. And I would say 
I would also say there's lots of uh, good things to say about properly executed fundamental research because you make one applied paper, it's useful to people in that field, but might not necessarily easily or obviously generalize. You write a good fundamental paper, you can feed the entire village, right? So there's lots yeah. of different uh, uh, downstream applications which can then make advantage of this. And I think, you know, if I can circle back to graph attention networks, we initially developed them for the perspective of this uh, brain related uh, mapping problem. And, you know, we ended up publishing a paper both on the fundamental graph attention network contribution and on its application to the brain mapping data. Very few people today would know that graph attention networks were originally inspired by neuroscience. Uh, if you just look at the citation counts of those two papers, like the fundamental paper ended up being a pretty interesting and generalizable idea, which didn't just work inside brain mapping. If we only published it inside brain mapping, probably people would not know about our model as much as they do right now. So that's, that's just yeah. one example of why I think it's good to have a fundamental grounding in everything you do. That being said, I want to build things that are useful for people. I want to build things that are useful for scientists as well. That seems to motivate me quite a bit these days. So uh, let's say fundamental research uh, in the front, but uh, it should always be fundamental research that has a prospect of, of usefully landing in somebody's hands down the line. Yeah. And I think even for like, I think labs like DeepMind and Google, I think they have been focusing more on applied research and, and, and indirectly it has uh, propelled the fundamental science a little bit more, right? Like I think in the, the idea of making an application and making it much more further improved indirectly, I think it's like an induction that goes on between both the fields. You have a fundamental paper that's really good, like it it induces some effect on applied research and the same way vice versa. So it's, it's a very good synchrony between these two particular fields that that's, um, that has been the acceleration mode uh, for AI research. So, yeah, and, and and yeah, I mean, talk, talking about acceleration, I think uh, one of the key things that young researchers getting into the field of AI would like to know is, we, we know that the landscape of AI has been shifting very fast. Like before I think I, I joined my PhD, I was seeing this whole new boom around vision. And now we see uh, large language models, the whole field of NLP uh, with the hype nowadays. Um, how much would you say or would you comment on the personalities that people can relate to when it comes to academia or industry? Because typically, like before before the whole uh, image net revolution came, like people who were in AI research tended to be more in academia. Not a lot of people used to be in industry. But now it's completely the opposite. Like lots of groundbreaking and nice work is being done in industry also. And there are like some kind of trade-off between these two sectors. I would say, if you want to do AI research. So in, in your experience, how, how would you say people can categorize uh, personalities based on these two sectors? Like, where should I be if I want to do AI research? Hmm. I guess it's fundamentally a question of uh, what motivates you and what inspires you. Both sides, like both academia and industry, have pros and cons associated with them. And uh, what works for one person might not work for another. I actually really like some things about industry and I really like some things about academia. <clears throat> and that's part of the reason why, beside from my full-time job with Google DeepMind, I also have an affiliation with Cambridge where I teach a course and occasionally advise students. Like those are exactly the things I love about academia, being able to interact with students, being able to teach, being able to inspire the next generation of researchers to, uh, to have a good grounding and to have the right kind of uh, ideas and, uh, and foundations. This is something that uh, you cannot get as easily inside industry. And uh, in industry, you're often more focused towards achieving a particular objective. And uh, from that perspective, you don't have a lot of time to like explore super blue sky ideas or like uh, train someone who comes from a completely different field to yours on how to do the basics of machine learning. We teach uh, a course on geometric deep learning at Cambridge and every year we get, it's not very common, but every year we get a handful of students who have never really properly studied machine learning before. And for them, this is one of their first introductions with machine learning. And while that presents a very interesting challenge in and of itself, how to explain such a topic to, and, you know, this generally improves my, uh, my communication skills and whatnot, but uh, also being able to talk to them, to hear their perspectives, to hear what they find important 
it's often very different to what I hear from a long-term colleague tell me what is important. And these yeah. kinds of interactions, they tend to happen a lot more in academia than they do in industry. So to me personally, both are very important, but I would say the more general takeaway message is figure out what you like about one, what you like about the other. And, uh, you know, just because you're in industry doesn't mean you cannot be academic in certain ways. Just because you're in academia doesn't mean you cannot have engagements with industry. In fact, many academics nowadays do have engagements with industry. So I would say, you know, find the mixture that works best for you and for your principles and your temperament, rather than try, rather than trying to explain like uh, <clears throat> what's good about this, what's bad about this. The good and bad may well depend on what you like. And like you, you have been exposed to different kind of roles because you have been working at DeepMind for uh, quite a bit, and now you are much more senior in, a, in in terms of your experience. What kind of things you think you can advise to young researchers that they think like you think they are maybe doing right or doing wrong in terms of getting better at AI research? Because I mean, to be frank enough, it's it's a new developing field, so there's no real blueprint for what to do and what not to do. But any advice for being good at AI research? Sure, that's a great point, and. Uh... I like to think that at least in spirit, I'm still young, even if uh, even if I'm yeah. <laughs> more seniority in recent times. So uh, it's a great question. It's one that I've extensively written about. So if you go on my website, you go on my uh, contact section, I have pointers to a few uh, Twitter threads that I wrote in the past that summarize some of this advice a lot better than what I will regurgitate now. But generally speaking, I would say there's two main things that helped me. So these are I need to be clear, these are things that I've learned to, through trial and error that ended up working quite well for me personally. I've also found that they worked well for some of the students I worked with, but they are not universal suggestions. So, you know, yeah. it's always take it with a pinch of salt, take what works for you, throw away what doesn't, right? And I've done the same thing when I've taken advice from others. So first thing I would say is it's very easy to feel overwhelming. Science originally was not designed to progress at the pace that it's progressing at right now. Like a normal conference or even journal, which is even worse, publishing cycle lasts for like at least five or six months, right? So by the time a paper is actually physically presented in a conference, it is already quite outdated by machine learning standards. This was not the way science was originally designed to progress. It was designed to be a bit slower so that this uh, conference still represents, you know, the latest and greatest that uh, research had to offer at that particular point in time, more or less. Now, a six-month period is a really drastic period. So it's very easy to feel overwhelmed by what is happening. But I would say that uh, uh, it's all a matter of perspective. Like on one side, you can see it as, oh, I'm going to fall behind if I don't follow these five latest trends every single day and so on. That's one way of looking at it. That's that's an anxiety promoting way of looking at it. But there is a more peacefully promoting way of looking at it, which is if things are progressing so quickly that, you know, we learn, relearn and unlearn things at such a regular pace, then that means at any point in time, I can basically decide to jump into the action and I can still contribute meaningfully. And that was one of the things that pushed me through my PhD personally, because in the first years, especially, I had lots of fears about falling behind, about not being able to keep up with everything that's happening. And then somewhere in the middle of the whole thing, I realized actually it is by design that you cannot keep up with it. Nobody can. And it's really like, whenever you feel ready to take on a new challenge, look up what's currently topical around that challenge and embark on a journey to improve something. You know, in, and this is a formula that has worked really well for me in the recent years. I, there have been maybe one or two situations when I was scooped, but when you, you know, compare that to the number of papers that I published uh, over that same period of time, I think it's relatively negligible. So, Generally speaking, it is a good idea to not overwhelm yourself and stress about keeping up to date with things, especially as they dynamically change, but rather, you know, choose your moment. When the moment comes, find something that's recent that you'd like to extend and focus on that and try, you know, keep reading the literature, but try to be a bit more holistic about it and don't spend as much time as you want, as, as you think you need to to actually reading through everything that's happening. So that's the first thing. Try not to get overwhelmed because, or at least look at it from a less anxiety-inducing way. 
And the second point is uh, about how to go about presenting your work in an optimal way. So a PhD, I'm talking here from the perspective of a PhD, but I think you can apply similar ideas to, uh, to other things. So maybe even master's degrees or when you start out in a research institute, I think similar principles apply. One thing that's very valuable about all of these placements and courses is that you are getting to build your own network of people. Like you're surrounded by people with interests similar or similar-ish to yours. And uh, you're all kind of, at least for the present moment, stuck on the same boat together and you're working towards similar or related objectives. Take this opportunity to connect with them to see if they have some other collaborators that might be interesting to work together with you. Take a moment, you know, just to chat to people about their blue sky ideas, maybe not so much with the intention of working on a project together. Like let those ideas come organically through conversations about what people are interested in and just try to talk to people as much as you can. So like my PhD advisor told me, fully rightfully so, that a PhD is all about expanding your network. It's much less about the specific papers you publish. In most cases, people will not really remember the papers you published during your PhD. They will remember what comes afterwards. A PhD is just an entry ticket to something much bigger that comes after it, right? So this is, uh, this is, this is one thing I would do. So then in terms of how to present your work to the broader community, I think that uh, one thing that's quite valuable that not everybody might be immediately able to see, especially if you're not in like... Uh, some of these uh, institutions that regularly publish at such venues is try to think less, at least initially, about publishing at top tier conferences and think more about publishing at top tier workshops. So every mm -hmm. single year, the top three conferences, NERFs, iClear and ICML, they have a ton of workshops attached to them. And those workshops are niche topics or specialist topics so uh, they will attract people that are specific to that field and they will typically have uh, much less strong conditions on what the paper needs to look like. Often there will be even a four page limit. So they will accept like partially completed papers or work in progress papers. The acceptance rate will tend to be a lot more favorable, usually around 70 to 80% for most of these venues. So it's much more favorable than like a, a typical conference where if you're lucky, one in four papers gets in or something like that. So it's much more competitive and the game is very different. And, but then, there, then the irony of this whole thing comes. So workshops are way less competitive. They are way less advertised. But then you actually yeah. go into a workshop like this and you find yourself surrounded with the top experts on exactly that thing that you wrote your paper in. So you'll get direct feedback from people who might be your future collaborators, from people who might be your future reviewers. You'll get all you need to take what you've written so far and now package it into something that a conference might find more acceptable. And I know so many cases of students that have took this advice very literally and done a great job with it. And, uh, the, and because these workshops are attached to the main conference, you can still meet a lot of amazing people at the conference and those will be top tier researchers build your portfolio, meet like-minded people, and you know, don't worry so much about going to the main conference poster sessions because there you have a problem, right? These are papers that have survived this really challenging process of being one in four, but it's all of machine learning, which is a remarkably wide field. So you'll get, like I present papers at these top conferences every now and then, and I get people coming to my poster that have nothing to do with the area that I'm presenting about. And I get way less interesting feedback or way less relevant feedback on average that way than when I publish a much smaller and shorter paper at a workshop. So yeah. it's almost, it's one of those rare win-win situations where like it's less effort for a potentially bigger immediate reward. And it's something that's generally, at least initially, a much more saner way to develop idea gradually. Not all ideas need to immediately be packaged in a full conference paper. They can start small and then gradually get incubated as you uh, present the work to others. Oh, one last piece of advice, uh, which is related to that. Present your work to others frequently and whenever uh, relevant. It will help develop your communication skills. And also, it will help you beat your inner perfectionist because Everybody is always, like the general attitude is always to be critical about one's own work and to think it could be better or it's not worth publishing before I do this or that, right? Yeah. The, the, the reality of the situation is that like uh, 
in most cases, things that you find super, super important, the community might not find them that important. And you won't be able to find that out until you put your work out there and share it with others. And you might be surprised by what you discover. You might not only find that things that you obsessed over were not really that important and you can still publish your work totally fine without it, but you might also find that some things you never took into consideration are actually important. So it's a great way to self-calibrate and actually do something that uh, the broader community will resonate with rather than spend a long time to build something that in your mind uh, feels like it should be the best paper, but uh, uh, then it holds you back if you don't achieve everything that you set out to do. Because in research, you very rarely achieve everything you set out to do. Yeah, yeah these are fair points. I mean, like, uh, yeah, I, I, I love these uh, points because they provide a kind of good confirmation to some of the paranoid uh, ideas that goes along the lines of any young researcher because we are either very anxious about like getting number of papers, number of citations. And then one thing that my, my advisor said, like which resonated with me the most is like doing PhDs, like more like a researcher in training. So you don't have to be like the most uh, highly uh, cited pu public pu uh, author or something like that. So because you're more learning the, the fundamentals of doing a research rather than just uh, publishing works that are sitting on the giants of sh uh, like uh, shoulders of giants so yeah and, and and i think one thing that you mentioned like i resonate a lot is um, like presenting your work right so i i recently published uh, presented my work at uh, an applied re research conference for medical ai and a lot of people First of all, I was astonished that a lot that a lot of people are interested in this work, which was a good confirmation for me that I'm I'm just not working any uh, on on any kind of dead field. And the second thing is like they were inputting some kind of feedback based on their knowledge of interpreting these clinical results because this was something I was proposing that it will make a clinical impact. So they were trying to say, why don't you do this? Because if you do this, it would be helpful in my clinical analysis. And they they are like excellent points because it, it, it's 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 much more along the lines of how you validate these results rather than just having like accuracy numbers or AUC numbers. So yeah, I think I I, I mean I, I won't be commenting on seconding on most of these stuff, but I think these are the fantastic points, and it's useful for people feeling very anxious nowadays. And just one one follow up I have is like maybe I can ask you, and I would just be plugging in my selfish question is. How much do you think uh, doing a PhD is really useful nowadays um, when you yeah, when you want to work in AI research? Let's say I'm a person who just wants to be associated in AI research. First of all, my question is like, is PhD worth it? I, I mean, you did talk about like expanding your network and those kind of stuff, but have you seen any other benefits uh, of doing a PhD and still wanting to pursue your career in an industry? Mm. Yeah, it's a great question and one which has a similar themed answer to basically a lot of the things I've already told you, which is uh, it really depends on you and your temperament and what you want to achieve. Yes, it used to be a case that to have a <clears throat> high ranking position in AI research, you had to have a PhD. But uh, today the story is not like that. And uh, as the field becomes more open, there are more, more and more recognized paths to impact and they don't have to come from a PhD position. I work at DeepMind with some really fantastic people who do not have PhDs and have had arguably a lot more impact on the field than I have. And this is totally normal. Like how much impact you're able to get should not always be directly correlated with having a PhD. Does that mean a PhD is not useful? So if you just want to you know, be part of the AI discourse and participate in AI engineering and maybe work at an engineering oriented position, yeah, you very likely don't need a PhD to do that. And arguably, you can have more impact and more resources than many people who do finish a PhD. Now, that being said, why did I decide to take the crazy plunge and do a PhD myself? Well, it's because of what a PhD offers. And uh, it really offers you, as I said, you know, this opportunity to have, uh, you know, a three or more year period during which you will focus exclusively on a particular topic of research that's uh, of interest to you. And, uh, you know, you won't really have, at least in the UK, it was like this, like we didn't have any coursework or anything like this. So it was really just about research and, uh, you know, building connections. And I was completely free for the most part to, to manage my time and decide what to do with it, which is both fantastic and scary because, Probably if you've come into a PhD after just doing formal education before that, you haven't really had a chance to organize your time to that level when there's no intermediate exams or anything like this to work towards, right? 
now suddenly you are the one who measures your success. And not to mention yeah. it's a bit of an adversarial environment as well, because as we just discussed, the amount of resources you get as a PhD student does not often compare to like some resources that a person who didn't decide to do a PhD, but ended up going to an AI uh, institute or a research company would have, right? So, and like to add on top of that, you're expected to, you know, publish a certain amount of papers during that period. So you have to figure out all the intermediate steps that will allow you to be competitive in such a scene in the scope of uh, a relatively short amount of time, right? It's a, it's many, it's many years, but it's relatively speaking in the context of your entire career, a short amount of time. So, you know, what, what you, what you might be able to say there is that, uh, being able to navigate all of those challenges and how to organize and orchestrate your research and take meaningful advice and give meaningful advice. If you decide to also do a bit of student advising on the side, it's an experience you cannot get anywhere else in that particular raw stripped down form. And uh, there is a reason why a PhD is considered still to be a gateway into fundamental kind of, into driving fundamental research. You can conduct fundamental research without a PhD, but like being properly equipped to, uh, you know, steer and drive long-term research directions is something that a PhD trains you for and very few other things train you for that. I would argue still that the PhD is the most effective way to train for that. So if these kinds of things are what inspires you and you want to, you know, experience that absolute level and absolute dread of full flexibility for a relatively short but still sizable amount of time, then a PhD is still, in my opinion, a relatively indispensable thing to do. That being said, I've just described a lot of things that are not good about PhDs. So <laughs> I fully appreciate that they will not be the right path into the field for many others. So, you know, choose your own battles depending on what really is interesting to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't have anything more to say apart from the fact that, yeah, it's it's true. I think doing a PhD in general would help you lead a particular project in terms of the fundamental sense. So like the idea of like how it trains you to uh, read the literature and push the field in terms of publishing these works, getting reviews and rebuttals. And the idea of defending a particular idea is something unique to itself, which industry sometimes might, might, might help you offer that, but it's not guaranteed. But in PhD, you are guaranteed to have that kind of training. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a valid point. And yeah, in the interest of time, I'll just conclude. I think it's, it was a fantastic podcast. Thanks. Thanks a lot for being here. I think we touched a lot of different topics in particular, I think your works on graph representation learning and algorithm reasoning, which I think I personally also do uh, like to read about these more stuff. And I'll be, I'll be following your research work a lot more on that. And I'll be also linking the resources that we have referenced in the show notes so that people can refer to get a better idea apart from the conversation that we had, because it's, it's much more in depth. We to be, I think touched much more on the surface level, level uh, idea of definitions and idea of these works. So apart from that, thanks. Thanks a lot for being here. I think it's fairly late for you in the evening. So thanks for sticking around and making this podcast. And in general, I think I've been following your works, tweets. They are very insightful. So please keep doing that. Uh, it's useful for people like us sitting far across from you. So thanks a lot for being here and appreciate being on the podcast. No worries. Thank you for having me. And as, as I mentioned, I do hope that you will find something useful in what I said. Don't take everything I said as gospel. Find the parts that work for you, as is with everything in life.